I'm Erin Sullivan and I'm from Boston and I work at the Harvard Medical School Center for Primary Care. Good morning. <laughs> so I grew up watching Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. In case you're not familiar with this drama, uh, it was about a wealthy female proper Bostonian who moves to the then Wild West town of Colorado Springs. When she gets there, she sets up her own practice, and she's the only physician treating this community. She treats multiple flu epidemics, diabetes, morphine addictions, fractured skulls, delivers babies, and even does plastic surgery. Once the residents of Colorado Springs decided a woman could be a doctor, they gave her the trust and respect that would be accorded a highly educated person at that time. Dr. Quinn was from a different era. Germ theory was relatively new, and most people were dying by the age of 50 from acute infections. A few interesting things happened by the time of World War II. We figured out hand washing would prevent, prevent the spread of germs, that mass production of antibiotics made treating those acute infections easier, and medicine started carving up the human body into different body parts and diseases, and subspecialization takes over. So then if you fast forward to my hometown of Boston, land of the specialists in 2016, great for a face transplant, basic sinus infection can be a total nightmare. Now many of you probably know this story, this case, I'll review it quickly. There's a patient, let's call her Erin. She gets sick every winter, as winter gives way to spring, stays home a few days, resists calling the primary care office. When she gives in, the receptionist tell her, tells her she can't get in for two days. She's put on the phone with a nurse, who Erin then negotiates to get an appointment that day. And then when she gets there, she has to start telling her tale all over again to the medical assistant. Eventually, she's seen by a frazzled primary care physician, who says, it's a virus. Not what Erin wants to hear. She reminds the physician that, hey, this happens every year. Look in your records the last six years. Always need antibiotics to get rid of it. It's a virus. Erin goes home, misses more work, gets sicker. Most recently, this tale took an interesting turn. Erin got really sick, and by the end of the week, was back in the primary care office seeing a different provider. She got the antibiotics. But the provider kind of looked at her before she let her leave and said, you know what? Uh, you're so sick, don't call us this weekend. Don't go to our urgent care. I think you'd be better off in the ER where your specialist is. OK. So I admit it. I'm Erin. <laughs> and as a patient, this is a very frustrating experience. And I'm wondering, where is Dr. Quinn when I need her? But as a researcher at the Center for Primary Care, I'm seeing this ER referral as a primary care system failure and a failure of trust. And I know how we got here. Primary care has gotten more complex. Medicine has gotten more complex. The information age has taken off. And we can't know all there is to know anymore, not just in medicine, but in other industries too. In the 1990s, the Harvard Business Review pointed out there was a new corporate structure to deal with complexity and information. It's called the team. And we need teams in healthcare to deal with complex situations. When I say complex, I don't mean hard. Specialists are great for simple problems that are hard. So my friends that are endocrinologists, they're trained to deal with diabetic patients that have failed three kinds of insulin. That's their training. They can do that. They don't need a team. They're trusting that the primary care physicians are going to deal with the easy problems that are complex. So noncompliance, the diabetic that's not taking the insulin. And while it seems like an easy problem because you need your patient to just take the medication, it's not about remembering to take medication. It's about the fact that maybe the patient can't afford the medication. Or 
maybe the patient can't afford the food that they need to take the medication, or doesn't have stable shelter with her refrigerator to keep the medication in. Now that's a complex problem, and that requires a team. A team that patients trust, a team that trusts their own processes, and a team that trusts each other. And if you think about any successful team from sports to healthcare, no team is gonna thrive in a trust-scarce environment. And if there's one thing I've seen in my research, is that the lack of trust and that scarce environment of trust is killing primary care. But I've been privileged enough to research with some bright spots. And I've noticed that one of the things they do is they transition the physician from the commander that has to know it all and manage every aspect of patient care. The physician becomes a team leader. And nowhere is this clearer than at the South Central Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska. And when I traveled there, I noticed a system that was very different than what I had experienced in Boston. The first thing, there are no patients at South Central. They call them customer owners because Alaska Native and American Indian people own their health system, and South Central trusts every individual to be responsible for their own health and wellness. They also spend an incredible amount of time untraining physicians. They train their physicians to move from the commander, master, to a place of being a team leader of trusting everyone around them to do their jobs, to do what they're trained to do. And in that environment, they're hoping that the patients or the customer owners will trust the care team, the care team will trust each other, and actually across the entire organization of 1,700 people, there will be an environment of trust, to the point that the only person who can fire someone at South Central Foundation is the CEO. So they've made trust a core value. The other thing they've done is they've changed their metrics of primary care. They track everything you're supposed to track, but they've decided it's really important to look at things a little differently. And one physician told me that <clears throat> when his team has a clear schedule at three o'clock in the afternoon, his team's successful. It means they're managing their customer owners well and efficiently. The other thing is that customer Customer owner feedback is very important to South Central. They collect it in about eight different ways. And their customer owner satisfaction rates peak at about 96.9%. That's like your cable company having a 96.9 satisfaction rate. So then I traveled across the country and spent some time in Bangor, Maine with Martins Point Healthcare. And I originally went there to study the teamlet model in action, but I actually learned two interesting things about trust. The Martins Point team had enabled their care team using technology and a high level of training. So their patient service representatives, average level of education was high school. <clears throat> and they had trained these PSRs, patient service representatives, that were operating at the highest level to do two things. One was to queue pre prescription refills using the firms or the organization's IT system, and then the provider would sign off. The second thing they did, and this causes a lot of drama, is they had trained their patient service representatives to do the patient triage over the phone. A lot of people hear this and gasp, <gasps> a nurse is not doing the triage. No, and in fact, the providers trusted the system, the IT system, and the training, and they trusted the PSRs. So that actually enabled the providers and the nurses in that practice to spend a lot of time with the patients when they came in. The other thing I learned at Martin's Point was the absence of fear is trust. And I've worked with a lot of organizations, but I've never been invited to a 7.30 a.m. morale meeting. So I was actually at this organization at a time when they were understaffed, they were going through a technology transition, and they got everyone together. And as I sat in the corner and noticed this morale meeting, I noticed everyone spoke equally and shared their thoughts, opinions, ideas, and everyone's opinion counted equally. And that meant the team was actually very quickly able to move from 
venting to problem solving and things we can do today to make our lives in this transition a little bit easier. So in that room, the absence of fear was trust. And finally, most recently, I traveled down the eastern seaboard to Camden, New Jersey to work with the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. Camden Coalition works with some of the most complicated and complex patients in America. And <coughs> Jeff Brenner, who is the CEO, and only physician in their organization, trusts his care teams on a day-to-day -day basis to manage their patient panels. Because Jeff's really busy being a CEO. And he's trained his team well. In fact, when Jeff was a family physician in Camden, New Jersey, he realized he wasn't going to be able to impact the health of his patients on his own. So when he built the coalition, he built two teams to manage these complicated, complex patients. The other thing I noticed at Camden Coalition is they have to manage trust and build trust on multiple levels. They have a very interdisciplinary team. So they have to build trust internally and have people speaking the same language. They also work in the community with multiple partners. So they have to build trust with those partners, especially because Camden does a lot of work around the social determinants of health, food, shelter, transportation. They're reaching way beyond the healthcare system to care for these patients, and that involves building trust with their partners. So <clears throat> I've given you a few examples of bright spots from my own research, and admittedly, I don't know the payment or policy structure to make this all work. These are experiments. These organizations are actually experimenting with policy and payment themselves. But what I do know is I don't think we're going to be able to scale primary care effectively without trust and without trusting teams. So I would invite you today to think about trust scarce teams and trust abundant teams as you're listening to the conversation. Because this isn't about if or when teams are coming to primary care, it's about how. And unless you want to be Dr. Quinn, somewhere on the new frontier, you're going to need a team, and you're going to be part of that team. So I hope you'll think about that in a frame of trust scarce and trust abundant teams. Thank you.